Good evening, everyone, and I welcome you to this wonderful evening talk by Associate Professor Srila Roy. And before we begin the program, I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of this land. I would also like to pay respect to the elders, both past and present, of the Kulin Nation and extend that respect to other indigenous Australians present. I'm very happy to stand here um, and thank you to the Australia Indian Institute for inviting me to chair this wonderful session. Uh, I'm a fellow at the Australia Indian Institute. My name is Dolly Kikon and I teach anthropology development studies here at the University of Melbourne and I am often part of the Australia Indian Institute um, <coughs> family. And this evening, I'm very excited to introduce Associate Professor Srila Roy. Uh, our first meeting was in Delhi, in the heat of Delhi. We were talking about friendships, militarization, and um, the Indian state in JNU. From there, our conversations led to our meeting in Oslo, where we were having conversations <laughs> with other scholars. I think uh, you were having a conversation with Rakar Ray, and Nandini Sundar and I were in conversation about our book. And one of the points that I would like to emphasize this evening is that uh, the conversations that Srila Roy has continued to have as a family scholar has always been a part of a collective, not an individual journey, but in terms of collective across continents. And as a scholar from India who studies India, feminism, politics, I have immense respect for the work that she does. And it's a joy and a privilege to introduce her to the crowd this evening. So Associate Professor Srila Roy teaches at the Department of Sociology at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. She has a BA in Philosophy from the, Delhi, from the University of Delhi and an MA in Philosophy and Social Theory and a PhD in Sociology, both from the University of Warwick in UK. She is an editor of Feminist Theory, the associate editor of the Journal of South Asian Development, and she is on the editorial board of the Sociological Review and the International Advisory Board of Feminist Dissent. She is also a council member of the South African Sociological Association and a member of the South African Young Academy of Sciences. Her long-standing research interest is in the constitution of political subjectivity at the intersection of gender, caste, class, and sexuality in post-colonial contexts, especially India and South Asia. This is, more this is most manifest in her amazing monograph titled Remembering Revolution, Gender, Violence, and Subjectivity in India's Nasalbari Movement, published by Oxford University Press in 2012. This is one of the first books on the gender and sexual politics of Indian Maoism, and it draws on women's personal narratives collected through extensive field interviews alongside historiographic, popular, and personal memoirs. This book contributes to feminist theorizing of women's relationship to violence, besides crossing over key debates in the study of social movements, cultural memory making, psychosocial studies of identity formation, and ethnographies of violence and conflict. Her current project draws on an ethnography of women's and sexual rights movements in economically liberalized India to consider feminist self-making in neoliberal times. Globalization and the opening up of the Indian economy since the early 1990s have promoted unexpected changes with respect to gender and sexuality, especially via the growth of the development sector. This project, initially funded by UK's British Academy, focuses on two things that best represent current trends, namely economic empowerment and sexual rights. Both case studies raise critical questions about the nature and effects of organizing around women's and sexual rights, particularly through NGOs in the Global South, besides making manifest the unintentional and intentional manners in which feminist subjects are being produced in these contexts. As part of this 
project, she has edited a volume of essays on New South Asian Feminisms published by Z Books and co-edited a special issue on the Post-Colonial Studies Journal, Interventions on Modern Sexual Formations in India, and a volume of essays on New Subaltern Politics published by Oxford University Press in 2015. She is an amazing scholar, a deeply engaged feminist, often tackling and having conversations, which often does not maybe have quick fix solutions, especially when you're looking at gender politics and rights movements in the global South, especially in the South Asian context, and in India in particular, um, regarding what's happening, and yet she stands for me in her politics as a feminist scholar. So I'm very happy to welcome, on behalf of the Australian Indian Institute, this evening, Professor Sheila Rai. Thank you so much, Dolly. It's I mean such a such a warm and generous introduction, especially from someone who I've always considered an inspiring activist and academic herself, and indeed a mentor. So uh, very very humbling. Thank you so much. Uh, of course, thank you very much to the Australian Indian Institute for uh, hosting me. It's been already an amazing um, I think just one and a half days, but we've had a very very productive conversation. So thank you to Professor Craig Jeffrey for the invitation, but especially to Amanda and Amy, who've been very, very warm, wonderful, and provocative hosts, um, already pushing me to think uh, deeply and further in my current uh, book project. Um, I'm not actually going to talk very much about the book project, given that this is you know, a lecture which is meant to provide you with, I hope, a sort of flavor of you know, what we mean by feminism in the Indian context, um, you know how it resonates me, uh, how it resonates with conversations elsewhere. But perhaps in the Q and A, there'll be some time or possibility to talk about my own specific um, location or thinking within these some of these broader issues. Okay, so um, since the gang rape and murder of a 23-year-old uh, physiotherapy student, Jyoti Singh Pandey, in New Delhi, at the end of 2012, India has witnessed a surge of feminist activism. And uh, some of these slides, I just have a couple of images just to give you a glimpse, of, you know, a kind of a flavor of what was happening at the time. But you, you're probably quite aware that mass protests uh, broke out in the wake of this uh, gang rape and murder, and they brought about uh, an, an, an unprecedented number of protesters, including ordinary uh, young men and women, so ordinary citizens, onto the streets of the capital city of Delhi and very soon across the country and indeed globally. So the protests transformed the judicial, affective, and discursive landscape by forcing the Indian state to respond to the rape crisis and by placing into uh, you know, news channels, living rooms, and parliament discussions on sexual violence in ways that we haven't quite seen in more recent times. And in the afterlife of what has been called a critical event, Several initiatives, campaigns, and events emerged in the name of feminism, women's empowerment, and gender justice. So it seemed that feminism in India was more relevant than ever before. Now, the mood could not have been more different from when I started almost a decade ago researching the terrain of Indian feminist activism, which was then dominated by the state, uh, development, and NGO agendas. Academic and activist accounts were overrun by concerns around the institutionalization, professionalization, co-option, and depoliticization of feminist struggles at the hands of a number of agents, including the Indian, including and especially the Indian state, and not without a touch of nostalgia for sort of revolutionary times gone before. So my initial motivation for writing a book on contemporary Indian feminism was to counter such globally resonant narratives of loss that produced quite totalizing accounts of Indian feminism and indeed of Indian feminists as being institutionalized, co-opted, professionalized, and so on. Now, while these accounts undermined obvious markers of feminist renewal and radicalism, such as what we saw towards the end of 2012, 
They also fail to explain the lives of many younger women around me. Feminism provided for them, as it had for previous generations, a normative horizon to lead alternative lives and constitute a new sense of self and the social, especially, but not only, along the registers of gender and sexuality. At the same time, it was equally apparent to me that uniformly positive or celebratory evaluations of Indian feminism's renewal or expanding appeal amongst younger women, for instance, were not just partial, but perhaps even irresponsible accounts of the present. The present conjuncture was, after all, one in which gender equality, women's empowerment, and women's and, indeed, LGBT rights were being easily co-opted by the state, the international development sector, the Hindu right, and the capital market, and that too for reinforcing quite conservative agendas which were against the interests of women. As the anti-rape protests showed, uh, feminism's newfound uh, vibrancy and political potency served very disparate agendas, interests, and ends. So for instance, at the time of the protests, one of the slogans that came into the fore was around the death penalty. And feminists were very uncomfortable with this because the mainstream uh, Indian women's movement had never really been comfortable with asking for the death penalty uh, for rape. And I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that later. I believe here the Indian case is evocative of a more general and global predicament that contemporary feminism seems to find itself in. Across the North and the South, there is a new visibility, potency, and legitimacy to feminist knowledges, affects, and struggles, more than obvious in the, in the global and ongoing Me Too movement that broke out in October 2017. But alongside such powerful assertions of feminist agency, we also find a proverbial factory of other feminisms, neoliberal, lifestyle, celebrity, two ones which are actively imperialist and capitalist in rhetoric and effect. Current feminisms, we could say, are not merely susceptible to co-option by external forces, but seem to actively enable conservative agendas, given, for instance, the intensification of border control, the rise of right-wing nationalisms and neoliberalism, and the justification of imperial wars in the name of women's rights, which is the title of a new book by Sarah Farris, or the subtitle, rather, the book is on, um, on femonationalism, where she talks, for instance, about how gender equality has become a, a you know, rousing slogan uh, around many of these moves like controlling migration, um, justifying imperial invasions in particular contexts and countries, and so on and so forth. In short, whether in India or elsewhere, this is a conjuncture in which feminism and ideals of gender and sexual equality enjoy more widespread legitimacy than ever before. But paradoxically, at the same time, the fundamental contradictions of feminism as a political project have perhaps never been more visible or obvious. I will return to these conundrums in the course of my talk. First, let's tackle some definitional issues. If feminism is a generally vexed term, evoking all sorts of generally negative connotations in all sorts of people, it sits even more uneasily in post-colonial contexts. Be it South Asia or the Middle East, there's a long history of disidentification with, if not rejection of the term feminism, among women's rights activists, many of whom prefer to use women's movements over feminism. Unsurprisingly, the seeds of some such ambivalence are locatable in the Western origins of feminism as well as in the colonial national histories of these countries. The former has meant an unease amongst academics and activists to embrace a Western ideology and movement given their own relationship to the West. The latter, namely the colonial nationalist encounter, meant a framing of women's issues or the women's question in terms of the political parameters set by colonialism and nationalism. As many have observed of the Indian context, feminism and nationalism were closely interlinked, with women's movements adopting or aligning themselves to the nationalist goals of the newly decolonized nation. 
part of the allergy, as one scholar put it, on behalf of Indian feminists towards the term feminism was a way of shoring up their own nationalist credentials and proving that questions of gender equality or women's rights were not merely Western, but were indigenous to India. The quest for an indigenous feminism led, however, to tricky terrain in using, for instance, iconography from the Hindu religion, such as the Hindu goddess in, goddess in protests, um, in posters of the Indian women's movement, Indian feminists ended up strengthening right-wing nationalisms that have intensified in the current period. There have, of course, been other consequences of the close aligning of feminism with nationalism, such as the erasure of internal asymmetries of power pertaining to caste, class, religion, and sexuality. Consequently, the Hindu middle class, every woman, became the de facto subject of Indian feminism, as Krupa Shandilya puts it uh, when she's writing about the protests on behalf of Jyoti Singh Pandey. It would seem as if, in the current conjuncture, it is these questions of internal difference that supersede concerns over westernization. This is not to say that activists in India do not have to still negotiate their relationship to the West or face charges of westernization and elitism, which, which tend to go together from their detractors. Part of the rationale for not decriminalizing homosexuality in India, for instance, has been on the grounds of its Western or alien nature, notwithstanding, of course, that the roots of criminalization lie in colonial rule. Indian feminists have played no small part in presenting homosexuality as irrelevant to the needs of the masses of Indian women. Today, they are facing explosive questions from minority feminisms within the nation state, some of whom have made important transnational linkages with feminist activists elsewhere, such as Dalit feminists with uh, African American ones in the US. Younger women also appear much less defensive of the label of, of using the label of feminism, attributable perhaps to its glamorization by celebrity culture today. You might already begin to discern a generational narrative in my story of feminism in India. Indeed, as in the West, this story is invariably told in a generational mode, in a decade-specific manner, or as occurring in waves of change. While generally employed in the context of, of the women's liberation movement in the West, the wave model is not unknown in the historiography of Indian feminism. And while I too will employ the tripartite division of first, second, and third wave in the way I tell you the story of feminism's evolution in India, I want to simultaneously underscore the implications of employing such generationally inflected narratives, what they might leave out, and what the dangers might be of a single story, as Adichie has warned us. So to begin with, the categorization of first, second, and third wave is itself not consistently established by historians, with some locating the first wave in the 19th century, while others tracing the origins of Indian feminism to the explosive 70s. Either way, the anti-colonial and reform movements of the 19th century remain foundational to the contemporary moment and to feminist politics in the region per se. While this was a remarkable period for women's rights and Indian women in general, effecting far-reaching changes to women's education, modernization, political participation, and so on, it was also instrumental in attaching the women's question to nationalism. Thus, even as, and, and this is a kind of iconic book that explores some of these questions and also the roots of uh, women's movements in the global south uh, in terms of their relationship with anti-imperial struggles. Thus, even as middle-class Indian women modernized as new women of the nation in making, their primary affiliation was meant to be to the family, the private sphere, to the purity of nation and culture. As already mentioned, well into the post-colonial period, feminists grew on a culturally specific nationalist repertoire of Indian womanhood to reinforce their anti-Western and indigenous credentials. The feminist activists of the first wave of the post-independence Indian women's movement, educated, middle-class, if not elite, and urban, 
functioned within these inherited nationalist colonialist frames. Having emerged out of male-dominated left-wing political parties and groups, some of whom were indeed the subject of study for my first book, they were also strongly socialist. Together this meant a prioritization of issues and problems considered to be distinctive to Indian women, such as poverty, backwardness, and the lack of agency. The autonomous feminists of the 1970s and the 1980s worked solidly on recognizable constituencies of poor grassroots women with the nation state as their main point of address. They shifted the left-led focus on women's practical gender interests around material inequality, for instance, to more strategic gender interests, such as violence against women. The custodial rape of a 14-year-old Adivasi or tribal woman named Mathura epitomized for these feminists the manner in which sexual violence could not be separated from the logic and workings of the patriarchal state. Identifying the state as a major source of women's oppression was one of the ways in which I think the Indian women's movement departed from Western conceptions of gender equality, which were much more about equality between men and women only as groups. And to that extent, we could argue that Indian feminism has always been intersectional from the very start. The Mathura rape case, and this is an image of the protest against the Supreme Court judgment for uh, acquitting the police who were actually, who, who raped Mathura in custody. This rape case was also extremely significant for inaugurating a slew of successful legal reforms around violence against women. And also, one could say, for orienting Indian feminism itself towards legal approaches and strategies. Now, even as the autonomous women's groups of the 70s and the 80s constituted a very small percentage of the Indian women's movement, they gave it its most abiding legacy, especially in the qualities of radicalism and autonomy that have become normative to feminism as such. So even after the demise of these groups, autonomy, that is, freedom from political parties and external donors or funders, remains a cherished political ideal and goal amongst Indian feminists. Beyond that, the 70s have come to mark a kind of point of origin for the post-independence women's movement. Given the public nature of public or feminist protests, as well as the success that was achieved in effecting actual legal change. So much so that even in 2012, the anti-rape protests were compared to and often judged as falling short of this golden age of activism. Now, if the 70s mark the beginning of the Indian women's movement in certain readings of its history, then the 90s constitute a turning point. This was the decade of the opening up of the Indian economy and the introduction of neoliberal economic reforms that have generally come to be known as liberalization. Economic liberalization, as you might know, not only had far-reaching political and social effects, but also reconfigured the terrain of existing social movements, like the women's movement, while giving rise to new ones, like LGBT movements. Let me touch upon just two significant consequences of liberalization for Indian feminists. First, the rise of state feminism. Feminists came to be directly implicated in the expansion of state logic and governance through effective, effecting legal reform, as I've already mentioned, and in government-initiated women's development programs, women's commissions, such as the National Commission for Women, set up in 1990, and various other state-run exercises in the mainstreaming of gender. This new visibility of two women as a category also extended to the field of party politics, where women, particularly rural women, emerged as a significant electoral and political force through reservations and institutions of local governance. Yet the mood amongst Indian feminists was far from congratulatory. State feminism signaled for many the successful co-option of feminist struggles by forces that really had very little to do with feminist goals and ends. Feminist concerns around state feminism were most borne out in the legal reforms to combat violence against women. Besides the fact that very little was achieved in the realm of law enforcement, 
Feminists argue that such reforms inadvertently increase the power of the state, while deepening at other times the policing of women's lives under the ban of protection. Legal reform had also done little to change wider societal perceptions of the causes of violence against women, or challenge the pervasive culture of victim blaming that informed the police and politicians alike. It was in the light of this very ambivalent record that some argued that feminist engagements with the state and the law had effectively come to an end. Having said that, recent years have seen an intensification of demands on the state to address violence against women at least, as was more than obvious in the criminal law amendment of 2013 that followed on the heels of Jyoti Singh Pandey's uh, gang rape and murder. In making criminalization the ultimate answer to sexual violence, Many argued that Indian feminism now appeared much closer to US versions of governance or even a costal feminism. Together with state feminism, NGOs and NGOization emerged as a second area of concern in the 90s. And the second image is from uh, my own field work with some of these NGOs in the region of West Bengal. A majority of the autonomous women's groups that were formed in the 80s transformed into funded NGOs in this period, given the expansion of their own work and the need for sustainability. It was moreover these funded NGOs who obviously hired professional, trained staff and not grassroots political organizations that were seen to be taking important decisions on behalf of the women's movement as a whole. So while the first national level autonomous women's conferences in the countries were generally attended by non-funded, non-party feminist groups, by the time of the last conference in Kolkata in 2006, it was overrun by NGOs, suggesting for many, and I quote Nilanjana Biswasya, who says that the women's movement is a hugely funded affair today. So the NGOization of feminism evoked in the Indian context anxieties that we're familiar with in other, other contexts. While a majority of these had to do with the sacrifice of political economy, uh, autonomy to external and especially global funding imperatives, indeed NGOization and transnationalization are generally thought of as twin processes, others had to do with changes to the internal culture and functioning of feminist movements, moving away, for instance, from mass-based struggles to quite professionalized and bureaucratized modes of engagement. These anxieties also spoke to larger concerns about the neoliberal turn in development centered on releasing the hidden entrepreneurial capacity of poor, poor women in the global south as being the answer to systemic issues of poverty and underdevelopment. And of course, further uh, disabling the responsibility of the state. The fact that women's groups were now part and parcel of such a market-oriented and professionalized development sector prompted a sense of loss and despair, with many arguing that from the militant feminists of the 1980s, we had become, as one feminist put it, nine to five feminists. The generational tenor of such arguments is once again obvious, as younger women are seen to be encountering feminism through paid employment in state or NGOs, as against the non-funded, voluntary, and autonomous way in which past feminists mobilized. One consequence of such a generational account is the manner in which contemporary feminist formations, like NGOs, are not quite evaluated on their own terms, but for their failure to live up to past idealized standards. Instead, I've seen in my own research the great diversity in NGO practice, including their emergence as a major source of employment for low middle class women, as well as their promotion of issues that older women's groups never touched for fear of backlash such as female sexuality and lesbianism. The 1990s also saw a fracturing of the nationalist framing of the women's question in the face of internal critiques made by minority feminists, first lesbian and later Dalit. Dalit is the, is the term, the politicized term used for formerly untouchable groups. After all, the 90s was also the decade of deepening caste and religious-based cleavages in India especially through the rise of an aggressive Hindu nationalism, as well as caste-based politics, factors we know that have irrevocably changed the nature of Indian politics. 
In the face of such complex identity politics, the existence of the Indian women's movement as a singular cohesive entity was questioned, as was its claim and ability to speak on behalf of all women. This period also saw the remaking of feminist practice in concrete material terms, via, for instance, the establishment of a distinctively Dalit feminist position with its own political platforms, such as the National Federation of Dalit Women. While for some such internal critiques of feminism heralded its fracturing and possible death, for others it paved the way for a more intersectional and self-reflexive feminist practice. The 2000s signified a new visibility and direction for Indian feminist activism. A third wave, if you want. Now in the West, the idea of third wave feminism uh, serves, and I quote Jonathan Dean here, who says, to invoke notions of a break or paradigm shift from older forms of feminism to a new, lively, vibrant, contemporary feminism. While evaluations of the third wave are more cautious, if not critical, in the Indian context, a generational logic is equally at work here and tends to emphasize newness and a definitive break with the past as opposed to continuities across time. So at the start of the decade, what we saw was a number of spontaneous public protests and vigils led by middle-class youth in urban areas, uh, a lot of which took place in the capital city of Delhi, in response to some high-profile cases of violence against elite women. There were more explicitly feminist campaigns, like an Indian version of the International Slut Walk Marches, which was then given a new iteration in the Indian context as uh, a march for not being ashamed by sexual violence or victimizing or victimology. And of course the 2009 <coughs> Pink Chatti or Pink Panty campaign, which encouraged Indian women to mail underwear to members of a right-wing group that had attacked women for drinking in a bar for being un-Indian. The two events were considered important forerunners of new feminist interventions into issues of public safety, especially in urban areas, street sexual harassment, and wider rape culture. And of course, they came to a crescendo in the anti-rape protests of 2012. Rather than wait for state authorities to make Indian cities safer for women, these kinds of city-based feminist campaigns encouraged women to claim public spaces by and for themselves. They emphasized women's desires for unconditional freedom in the public domain, including the freedom to access and occupy public spaces without fear, and even to indulge in risky behavior like loitering or hanging out. And that's become a quite, a, you know, quite a major book in its own right, but also the forerunner of, of various movements where uh, mainly urban women are trying to occupy different kinds of public spaces like everything from parks uh, to roadside tea stores, public transport, in in different times of the day and night, and so on and so forth. Oh, and this is uh, men trying to also be part of this movement, and you know, and I thought it was important to have that image to emphasize how consciously intersectional these movements have been, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. But effectively, these were primarily middle-class metropolitan movements, which took place, obviously, in urban spaces, and that was set to influence the kind of issues that they were taking up as well as how they were choosing to do so, largely via social media. Now, while activists in the Indian women's movement have always been middle class, the anti-colonial and socialist roots of the movement meant that class was privileged over all other social variables. By contrast, new feminist movements were unapologetically mobilizing around issues that had particular relevance to them, such as public safety, but they also argued that addressing these issues would have wider implications across class. Their activism, which adopted, as I just said, a more intersectional approach to gender, class, and sexuality, seemed to emerge out of and respond to the deficiencies of the feminisms that came before them, such as a legal feminism that had focused only on women's victimology as opposed to women's pleasure, desire, or indeed um, ability to have fun. The third wave, also emerged in a time and place of neoliberalism, directly enabled by, the specific, by its specific material configurations, such as the use of social media, transnational links with feminist struggles elsewhere, 
increased education and employment options for women, and rising right-wing efforts to curtail these new freedoms, mobilities, and opportunities. Economic liberalism created, in other words, spaces for Indian women to politically intervene in ways that might have not have been possible for previous generations. And here I return to the paradoxes that I began with, namely the enablement of a new feminist consciousness, politics, and practice by a distinctly, distinctively anti-women project, i.e. neoliberalism. Thus, for some recent critics, new feminisms were problematic for a number of observed features, such as their emphasis on individualized responses to structural issues like violence against women, their emphasis on therapeutic ideals of responsibility, reform, enterprise, and an embrace of self-care and self-transformation as the route to political transformation. Urban feminist campaigns around sexual violence have thus been said to embody and reflect the consumer-oriented, individualistic, and entrepreneurial dispositions of metropolitan, middle-class Indian women alone, effectively a neoliberal feminism. Their mainly middle-class composition and over-reliance on social media as an activist tool have also raised questions and concerns around exclusivity and limited reach besides inviting accusations of elitism and westernization. For younger feminists who were part of slut walk type interventions, such criticisms were perceived as less to do with elitism or westernization than with deep-seated anxieties around the public expression of women's sexuality. Pink Chatti and slut walk campaigns centered, they argued in response, questions of women's sexual agency, pleasure, and desire in ways that mainstream Indian feminisms never had. Generational divides thus intensified in the third wave, and invariably in ways that produced monolithic accounts of the new feminisms on the one hand as being elitist, as well as the older feminists as being anti-sex. Let me end as I began with another critical event in the recent life of feminism in India that has brought these generational conflicts to a head. Towards the end of 2017, the Indian feminist community was riveted by an unexpected and rather ferocious controversy following on the heels of the global Me Too movement. In the space that was created, Raya Sarkar, a little-known graduate student of Indian descent at the University of California at Davis, published a list of sexual predators in the Indian Academy online. The cautionary list contained in the first instance 60 prominent male academics mostly located in premium Indian institutions, like JNU and some in the US, mostly Bengali, and mostly in the social sciences and liberal arts. No context, incident, details, or explanations of crimes were provided. The public secret of sexual harassment at the academy exploded, as it were, in the creation of this digital archive, or what some called a hall of shame. As the list gained traction went viral on social media, a statement was issued by 12 established Indian feminists on the popular political blog Kafila. It expressed deep discomfort with the act of anonymously naming men as sexual aggressors with no context or explanation, and even argued that this could, and I quote, delegitimize the long struggle against sexual harassment and make our tasks as feminists more difficult. It asked for this initiative to be withdrawn while emphasizing the importance of due process, which it said was just and fair. Many felt this was particularly ironic, given that just recently an Indian court of law had acquitted a well-known local filmmaker who had early been convicted of raping an American research scholar. The woman's no to oral sex was converted by the judge into a feeble no, or basically into consensual sex. What followed was a veritable split within the feminist community, and one that appeared initially to be along generational lines. Younger feminists were positioned, who were in support of the list, of course, were positioned as ungrateful daughters, vis-a-vis -vis a feminist vanguard that had paved the way for them. And older feminists, who were against the list, as naive if not reactionary in their belief in due process and the law. What started, however, as a generational debate rapidly became one about caste and class-based differences and hierarchies, as Raya Sarkar, for instance, identified 
as a Dalit feminist. While the upper caste politics of metropolitan Indian feminists were called out more and more from since the 90s, these internal differences reached a critical point in the controversy around the list. With Dalit Bahujan and Adivasi, or low caste and indigenous feminists, accusing upper caste or savarna feminists of subjugating their efforts and marginalizing their voices. While it is true that the mainstream Indian feminist community is indeed upper caste, solidly middle class and metropolitan, it has been acutely and perhaps overtly conscious of its own limitations. As already noted, Indian feminist campaigns, whether to do with sexual violence or livelihoods, have always been in the name of the poor and the marginalized, and more often than not, rural women. Thus, a whole range of issues from Eve teasing or street sexual harassment to homosexuality have historically not been prioritized in the favor of those presumed to have greater relevance to the masses or the grassroots. Acknowledging these kinds of historical nuances is not in order to defend Indian feminism from accusations of exclusion or marginalization made by Dalit feminists. It is, however, to make for a more complicated response to the question, why have Dalit voices been marginalized in Indian feminism? Such a response would not simply attribute this invisibilization to the elite status of many of the movement's vanguards, as many were claiming in the face of the conflict around the list. I have tried to show throughout this brief talk how a generational logic, if not a divide, tends to flatten out these kind of complexities and nuances. We could go further and say that the idea of generation fixes our gaze on differences across time, but not on the problematics of our present context. Contestations around caste cannot, for instance, be understood in generational terms alone. With the, with the list, Dalit minority feminists centered, decentered, sorry, majoritarian ones, and deeply disrupted nationalist framings of Indian feminism by revealing a vast terrain of multiple contestations and power relations. The list surfaced, in other words, long-standing contests that had always been there under the surface, seemingly new but less visible, especially in mainstream discourse. Rejecting their description as millennial feminists or along generational lines, minority activists frame the controversy around the list in terms of the power imbalances between Savarna and Dalit Bahujan and Adivasi feminists. They shifted attention from time to context and reminded us that the question of caste had persisted over time and within every generation of Indian feminists. So to conclude, Feminism, I would say, in India has emerged more and more as an object of contestation, with many asking at very many moments, what is feminism? Who gets to define it? Who speaks on its behalf? Who does it belong to? And what is its proper place? Contestations about something else, sexual violence, have invariably become contestations about feminism itself. And we saw this in the case of Jyoti Singh Pandey, and more recently in the case of the list around sexual harassment. These moments are deeply pedagogical in that they teach us how feminism is thought and made sense of, and they, how there might be multiple competing and even conflictual stories about feminism, and that too from within, internal to its own fold. This kind of self-reflexivity in a phenomena that Elson and Wiegman just designated as feminism beside itself in the West is perhaps new to Indian feminism, but is possibly more important today than ever before. At a time when feminism is both more popular and ambiguous globally, debates within feminism are a key way of interrogating and reformulating our assumptions behind core categories such as women, gender, politics, and so on, but also in order to fully appreciate the hybrid legacies and workings of what we might call Indian feminism. Thank you. So I could I just quickly thank Cassie for actually all her invisible labor in relationship to my trip, of which this was uh, an embodiment. Thank you so much. Thank you.
um, amazing, what an amazing um, lecture. And I will not waste time because we have 10 minutes. And uh, a very lovely friend and colleague, Amanda, where are you? I, ha yeah, I have to name you because she asked me, be strict, right? <laughs> If people are rambling, just cut them off and say, what's the question? Yeah, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to channel your energy. And I'm going to ask you uh, to keep it short and ask your amazing questions to Srila. And uh, we have, how do you do this? I, I can't even see. <laughs> I'm holding a microphone. We don't switching it on. Um, all right, OK. All right, OK, it's working. Wonderful. So yes, please, I open the floor to our amazing audience. So please tell us your name and uh, what you wish to ask. If it's a comment, keep it short. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Hannah McCann. Um, hi. <laughs> uh, I'm just wondering about the use of the term feminism, or um, I'm not sure how that's translated in different contexts in India, but um, as opposed to something like women's liberation, and what the history of that is in terms of the story that you talk about, the waves. Shall we take a, yeah, a couple and then we have 10 minutes, so we'll just give the time to Srila to roll with it, yeah? So, okay, that's Robin. Yes, yes, get it, yeah. My name is Robin Jeffrey. Um, uh, Sheila, could you say something about your view of the potential of young women resisting the patriarchy that goes with the Hindu uh, movement, becoming a force in future electoral politics or oppositions to that very uh, strident Hindu agenda? Shall we take one more? Yeah. 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 One more. Let's go with it. There. Just wondering where you see subaltern women's movements fitting within this narrative that you've talked about, like things like the Gulabi gang or mm. Dalit women's uh, activism. Are these feminisms? I think you should answer that. <laughs> Yes. yes, okay. So the first question was about feminism, and I think your question is not so much about the Western origin of the term, but the indigenous circulation of it. And yes, indeed, there are, you know, local uh, variants. And I think the, if you want, the second wave Indian feminists did quite a lot of work, I think, documenting and, you know, and, and having those kind of you know, documenting that material in uh, regional languages, you know, how does feminism translate and so on and so forth. But I think what's happened more recently is a sanitization of even the more radical uh, usage or terminology around uh, gender justice, where it's much more uh, in development speak and women's empowerment. So um, uh, in a regional context, what kind of example can I get? Like Naridvar would be the word for feminism, but now it would be um, Right, <laughs> women, women, which is basically women's development. But you would also have, I think, in rural context, thanks to NGOs, you would have women just using empowerment, like, you know, as in the English word. So it's quite striking how far those kind of discourses have, have, have traveled. And maybe I'll, I'll, I'll answer the question about support of women's movements. So I think, I mean, this is the danger of when, of telling the single story, right? Because there is so much attention to like the pink chattis and the blank noises and the white loiters, you are left thinking with, well, is there anything else happening in the terrain? You know, are there rural women's uh, mobilizations? And the answer is, of course, there's a, there's a lot happening. I mean, there's also mobilizations by right-wing groups of women in, you know, in, in vast numbers. So, so I think, yeah, we have to be really careful about not presenting this as a, I mean, of, and also India as a massive country. So there is a lot going on. But I will say that, again, at the level of, uh, at, at the rural level, and again, the regional specificity here is important. I mean, for instance, in the West Bengal context, I do think a lot of the terrain has been taken up by NGOs. So I, I think, or, 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 you know, or well, political parties like, you know, the Communist uh, Party network is still quite substantial. But I don't think 
we see in the West Bengal context a lot of spontaneous or autonomous women's uh, mobilizations, like for instance the Gulabi Gang. But it's interesting that the Gulabi Gang's uh, you know, main figure is now, well, she, I think she already stood for election, I don't know if she, she won. So there's a way in which she's also become, I mean, so that kind of vigilante form of uh, women's justice has now, you could say, been co-opted by the state or something like that. So, so I think that the terrain is the terrain is messy, and and there are, I mean, there's a lot of blurring between what is state, what is non-state, what is NGO, what is not. But I, I think we also have to be careful to then not, I mean, because partly your question was, is it feminist or not? So obviously, the rural women workers that I interact with, uh, they they're very low-paid development workers in who are working with NGOs, they wouldn't call themselves feminist, but I think they articulate a feminist discourse. I mean, they have a, they have a critique of patriarchy, they have a, a sense of the self which is expressed in, you know, in power agential terms, but not in terms of the market. So I would say that's feminist, even if they don't use the language. Um, the point about um, young women, so I felt that there were two questions that one is whether young women are uh, do they have a critique of Hindutva? Was that part of the question? Or was it that how are they going to work in terms of operate as an electoral constituency? Well, the, I think the question is, for me, uh, in the face of a blatant Hindutva patriarchal agenda, yeah. what is the prospect of a women's movement or women's movements uh, actively opposing that kind of agenda? What's the prospect for mobilization of that kind? Well, I mean, of course, it's been a priority for the mainstream women's movement, but I think it is an important question to ask whether it's a priority for younger women who are being interpolated into feminism through digital cultures, for instance. And I think the question is is, is yes and no. I mean, for instance, in, in some of the queer spaces I've been, which where there are younger women and indeed men, there is a, you know, there's a conscious talk. I mean, these are, these are you know, young people who are just out of high school, so the, so the kind of older people in the organization will make a lot of effort to, to have them understand the workings of uh, right-wing nationalisms and the dangers, and there will be critiques and there will be conversation. But I don't know, Amanda's own work in Delhi suggests maybe a kind of a different terrain where maybe there isn't that critique of the state or of uh, you know, the right-wing uh, right uh, politics. But of course, historically, they, that's been very much at the heart of the women's movement, a critique of the state and a critique, and a critique of Hindutva. I mean, that, that's really been absolutely central to that politics. I don't know if you want to add something um, to it. <laughs> we take one more? Yeah. Hohen, yes, one question. Yeah. Uh, sorry, the question is a bit long, so we shout. Um, I'm, I'm good at shouting, yeah, so keep it uh, short. My name is Pavan Singh. Um, my question is about the politics of normativity uh, in feminism. It's certainly there in the queer movement. Yeah. As much as there is this imperative to transgress and stage a more radical politics, yeah. there's also, uh, we've seen recently, there, there was a matrimonial ad posted by a mother for her son yes. looking for a room. And there was a mantra ad which also staged yeah. feminist kind of, uh, <laughs> feminine kind of normativity. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering how do you uh, see that within the feminist movement of the space that's most? Yeah, so uh, that's actually a, a big part of my current project, right? Thinking of the idea of, of normativity within social movements and how social movements act in both, both respects. They destabilize norms and they they restabilize and reproduce certain norms. And I think the queer movement in India is a perfect example because on the one hand, it might destabilize norms pertaining to gender and sexuality, but it, and now I think we, we're taking that as a given, it stabilizes norms pertaining to class and caste. And what do I mean by that? Which is just that, you know, it's basically metropolitan, middle class, upper caste, uh, gay, lesbian individuals who are the kind of face of the movement and who the movements, uh, whose interests and needs the movement most uh, responds to, right? And this is very much pervasive in the way in which we see, you know, uh, popular representation. So I think you were talking about, we're talking about the Mintra ad, which, where, I mean, so it's, it's, it's been, you know, it's been talked about as the first lesbian ad. It's, it's not actually the first, but anyway, it was quite remarkable. I don't know if you saw it, which is, uh, so it's it's uh, the product is an, is ethnic apparel, 
and, and the narrative of the advert, advert is basically a couple who are going to come out to their parents, so they're waiting for the parents to, to arrive, you don't see the parents, and they're having this little intimate moment where they sort of like, oh, they're going to arrive, are we going to be okay, yes, we're going to be okay. But what's so incredible about the ad is the way it's framed, right? So it's two women, um, they are wearing perfect ethnic apparel, but the, the whole deck of their, flag, of their flag is a MacBook, there's a poster of Clockwork Orange, there's a wooden antique table. So it's, so, so it's, it's not just any kind of aesthetic, right? It's the perfect glo Indian global aesthetic. The global Indian, right? The one who is, you know, is comfortable with handloom cotton, but also with clockwork orange, right? So, so, and and it's such for me. This was just like such a coming of age of, you know, queer representation, queer politics in India, because this is what it is. It's that the market is saying, and remember, you know, uh, being, I mean, homosexuality is still criminalized in the Indian context, but the market is saying. You know, we embrace and we accept you as long as you have the right distinction, the right taste, and you make the right consumer choices, right? So, I, so that's that's normativity in the social in you know social movements creating or uh, reproducing certain norms, and it's an old story, and it's not a story I think we can get away from. I think we just have to be very uh, mindful of the specific effects, right? So I think. Our analytic gaze has to be towards what norms are getting destabilized, what norms are getting reproduced, rather than saying in advance that woohoo, it's totally destabilizing, or it's all doom and doom. Wow! <laughs> Thanks. So, so we are we are out of time, but I'll just let you know if you look at the academy and your politics and your beliefs as a battleship. Um, you would want Sheila on your team. <laughs> and, and the reason I love her as a friend, as a colleague, and her work as a scholar is because she, she's right there. She doesn't shy away from difficult politics. She writes about it. She engages with it. And it's been a very lovely evening that I've learned so much from you. And I'm sure the audience is willing and um, excited to talk to you this evening after the talk and also in the near future. So please do join me in thanking Srila for this lovely evening. <laughs>